Economists tend to be quite sympathetic to it because it lines up quite well with the way that economists think. It emphasizes the importance of trade-offs, uh, the you know, benefits and costs, pros and cons of different act, uh, courses of action. Um, and it's applied uh, by governments to making a really wide range of decisions, instituting regulations, building uh, public projects, or creating public goods. But for us, we're going to focus on um, how benefit and cost analysis can be used to determine the level of externalities uh, so that we can impose Pigouvian taxes, cap levels of uh, goods, or um, uh, issue damages. So here our evaluation is to determine harms in the optimal level rather than just whether some discrete project should be undertaken. So um, the analyses tend to involve a number of different dimensions, including direct harms, so like destruction of economic resources caused by uh, the activity. Um, and we also have to determine what the market value of that harm is. Second, we have to figure out how um, uh, things limit the usefulness of economic resources, even if they don't physically destroy them. Um, and that requires assessing the market value of different uses of the resource and determining how that changes as a result of the externality. Uh, we also often think about the effects on human life and health, and we'll talk a lot more about that in a minute, as well as on intangible or subjectively valued harms, um, such as ones coming from some you know, ethical value that you place on society doing or not doing something, or that come from some sort of intangible benefit that you have from having the pelicans out there or something like that. Um, okay. So uh, a crucial element in evaluating all this stuff, it's purely sort of technical and scientific, um, and it asks us to think about what are the physical harms and benefits that follow from any given action that creates an externality. And this typically requires a detailed knowledge of a bunch of the externalities of creating a nuclear plant somewhere. You have to know what the chances are of the reactor spilling over, how much it harms people if they get hit by pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or another example of that would be if you want to figure out what the externalities were of setting up a particle accelerator in CERN in Switzerland, you have to know the chances that it's going to like uh, blow a hole in the universe or something like that, which some people would claim. Okay, so, um, you know, chemistry can be very important as well. So if you want to figure out how much does sulfur dioxide emissions cause acid rain, and how much do those in turn hurt crops, you need to know the chemistry of the atmosphere, right? Epidemiology can be very important. So, for example, if we want to know what's the externality to other people of you getting vaccinated, we need to know what's the chance of you transmitting a disease and what are the dynamics after you've transmitted it, of it being transmitted to other people, and so forth. So all these things are crucially important, but without sort of some economics on the back end to actually figure out what the value of that stuff is, that, that, that's completely useless. So for example, you know, Fukushima was a terrible event, but how do we know exactly how much the value of the land lost in Fukushima was? In order to you know, figure that out, we have to do an economic analysis of what's the market value of that land, how much does it fall in, what, you know, what could the land be used for before that it can't be used for now, etc. Um, when we think about you know, the effects of acid rain, it's not enough just to figure out physically how much uh, damage they do to crops, but how much they reduce the market value of the crops yielded by the land and how permanently they do so. Right? If we want to think about, um, you know, the value of you getting vaccinated, it's not enough just to know how likely it is that you spread the disease to someone else, but how much harm it does to the other person in economic terms that you spread the disease to them, right? And so almost every study that you'd want to do to think about externalities has to combine some detailed knowledge of the relevant science with some detailed knowledge of the relevant economics. And I'm going to try to show you how those interact today. So um, probably the most famous economic input into this type of analysis 
is the valuation of human life. So this is quite um, controversial because a lot of people will say that human life is just you know, infinitely valuable. Every human life is, you know, you can't put a dollar value on it. But this is clearly a bit silly because if, if your life was truly worth an infinite amount to you, you would never drive your car. Because you take your life into your hands every time you drive your car, right? And so, you know, if you were to drive your car to save five dollars on a calculator rather than buying it at the local store, you clearly don't put an infinite value on your own life, right? So, um, that means that as a society, we need to make the same sort of trade-offs that you make as an individual, taking a little bit of risk on your life if you can get a substantial financial gain as a result. Um, and um, <coughs> we, how much people are willing to risk their health in order, yeah. Okay. I mean, could you say that like it's not, you're not living your life if you're living in a bubble when you don't like you're taking any risk though? I agree. Okay. I would agree with that, because that, that's sort of the point. Like, you know, you're also not living a life if you have only one dollar a day to live on and you're like barely scraping by, right? So, and, and, and there's a whole spectrum along there. And so the point is there's a real trade-off between the utility that you earn given that you're alive and whether you're alive or not. And that's the same you know, trade-off that society has to make as well. So, um, and um, it's pretty obvious that the wealthier people are, the more that they're, willing to, they're going to be willing to pay in order to reduce the chance that they die, both because they just have more money to spend on things and because if you're wealthier, the utility you earn when you're alive is greater Right? And so you're going to be willing to pay more to stop yourself from not being alive. Right? And um, so uh, in this sense, a rich person's life is worth more than a poor person's life. And this is something that strikes a lot of people as really unfair. But if you think about it, uh, if you think that's unfair, well, there's a lot of other things you should think are unfair, too, right? Why do rich people get to live in bigger houses than poor people do? Why should, you know, if people, if a poor person would rather have a big house and live a shorter life, why isn't that just as fair as uh, having them live a shorter life, uh, or have live a longer life but have a smaller house? And So, I mean, once you start going that, down that road, you have to realize that the only you know, way that you can respect the choices that people make in their own lives is by saying that a poor person's life is worth less than a rich person's life if there's any inequality in other things as well. So um, we may well want to redistribute across people to try to reduce in inequalities, but you know, given how much distribution we have, the, the poor person's life is going to be worth less than the rich person's life is going to be. So, um, there are really three things that we need to measure, therefore, to figure out what the value of different human lives are worth. The first is the value of a life per unit chance that you die. That's called the statistical value of a human life, right? Because there's almost no amount of money that you wouldn't be willing to pay to avoid dying for sure. But if there's some chance of you dying, you'd be you know, uh, only willing to pay a small amount to avoid that, and that's called the statistical value of life. And we have to figure that out for someone in the population. We're not going to be able to figure out for everybody because to estimate it, we're going to need some data. We also might, from some other people, figure out what the value of various types of injuries are, like how much is it worth to people to avoid being paralyzed? How much of it is it worth to people uh, you know, to avoid going blind, et cetera? Um, and then we need to figure out a way from whoever we measure it to extrapolate it to the rest of the population. We're probably not going to be able to measure the value of the life to you know, millionaires or billionaires. We might measure it to you know, coal workers. And we need a way to sort of like figure out how that extends to millionaires and billionaires. And I won't talk that much about that part of it, but the estimates that have been made are that the income elasticity of willingness to pay for life is approximately 0.6 to 0.8. So sort of any estimate that we get, if we get it for someone who like, you know, is earning $100,000 a year, Someone who is earning a million dollars a year should be willing to pay about uh, is about seven times as much rather than ten times as much. Okay, so the usual approach to measuring the statistical value of a human life is that you assume um, uh, 
that the value that people place on um, their on like bad things happening to them, like getting hurt or dying, is all determined not by the manner in which the bad thing happens, but just by the fact that it happens, right? So in principle, you can imagine that people would be willing to pay much more to avoid being like you know tortured to death or you know asphyxiated than you know dying a peaceful death, right? But uh, if you start imposing restrictions like that, it becomes very hard to estimate this stuff because there's only a very few cases you have. So you sort of have to rule out that people care about how they die. Um, second, you look for cases where people have actually made a trade-off, where they could have basically paid more or accepted a lower wage in order to get uh, a large, smaller chance of dying or being injured. And um, uh, the most classic example of that is um, dangerous work like mining. It <coughs> typically pays much better for the same skill level to be a miner than to you know, do other jobs because people are taking a chance that they'll be, be killed basically in a mining accident. Um, or you know, when people decide how safe of a car to purchase, if you can control for a lot of other features of a car and see how much people are willing to pay for greater safety features, that's another approach that you can take. And then you can just look at the difference in price uh, and that is going to measure the willingness to pay of the person who is just indifferent between the two options, right? Now, the people who choose the safe car probably value not dying more than the people who, you know, choose the risky car. <coughs> and the people who go into the coal mine probably value their life less than the people who don't go into the coal mine and instead, you know, work at a store. Um, so you're never going to be able to measure how much those people value their life, but you can measure how much this person who's just indifferent between the two professions uh, values their life. Then you have to assume, counterfactually to what I just said, that everyone values their life about as much as the marginal person does, which is a heroic assumption. So there's obviously um, tons of problems with what I just described, uh, and it would be great if we could improve on it. This is about all that anyone's been able to figure out as a way to measure these things. Um, and I think the, the way as a result, one should interpret these numbers is not as like the number, but as something that's sort of in the right range of the number, right? So the numbers I'm going to show you are on the order of about five or six million dollars for someone who makes maybe fifty thousand dollars a year, and that um, is probably about right. So it's probably somewhere between one and ten million dollars probably not like exactly five or six million dollars. But at least this gives you some sense of the order of magnitude of how much people value their lives. And it can rule out crazy values that would like value someone's life at a hundred thousand dollars or value it at like, you know, a hundred million dollars, which are both probably way far off. Um, and in fact, this can be quite useful because there's a lot of government programs that either way undervalue human life or way overvalue human life. And this, can, this sort of criterion can be used to rule out both of those extremes. So, um, you can also, in principle, use surveys and ask people how much they'd be willing to pay to reduce their risks. But we'll see that these can be quite problematic, uh, and we'll talk about this in a moment. Okay, so you can, I don't know if you can really see these numbers, probably not very well, but this is like a giant list of studies that have been done. And probably the two most reliable numbers come from this Viscusi paper from the late 70s and this other Viscusi paper from the early 80s. And both of them have sort of 4.16, 0.5. Those were both based on choosing different occupations. The estimates that have been done based on people's choices of cars are quite similar. So those all seem to be agreeing on a number somewhere in the range of five to six million dollars for someone who's like a median uh, person in the United States. Um, probably a little bit higher now because wages have gone up. So my guess is it would probably be about more like eight or nine million dollars. But that's sort of the right range. Okay. Now, probably the most ambitious example of benefit cost analysis of all time is the, the Stern Review uh, of the Economics of Climate Change. It's about a thousand pages long. 
uh, and it was commissioned by the British government, along with others, um, to evaluate the social benefits and costs of climate change. And um, it had many, uh, many stages, and Edward is not here. Um, so first, it tried to determine what were the largest sources of greenhouse gases. And Matt Green? Yeah. Um, do, you, do you remember what the Stern report said about what the most important sources of greenhouse gases were? Let's see. Yeah. You're talking about uh, greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuels. Yeah, fossil fuels are definitely one of the most important ones. Does anyone else know? There's one other really important one. Yeah, David. I know that uh, as forests get cut down, um, less carbon dioxide. That's probably the third yeah. most important. Fossil fuels are the first. Does anyone know what the second is? Yeah. Livestock? Yeah, me methane. Methane. I mean, most of it comes out of livestock. Some of it comes out of bogs as well. But, but yeah, a lot of it comes out of animals. Animals are actually a huge source of greenhouse gases. Um, uh, Second was to determine what the effects of these gases were on, um, on global uh, climate. And uh, Jace, how did they go about doing that? Yeah, they basically looked at climate models, right? So, like, there's a whole profession of people out there who has the job of figuring out, you know, if the gas has changed by this much, how much will the global climate change? They basically constructed large-scale climate models which have lots of uncertainty in them, but which can give you some sense of the link between greenhouse gases and, and the climate, right? And the key point here was not to get one number, because the truth is these models are highly uncertain. It was more to get a sense of the range of potential outcomes that could result from certain things because you want to take into account all the you know, potential outcomes and how costly all of those are. So the third thing that they had to do was determine what the <coughs> economic effects of these changes would be. And, and Victor, that one, uh, what, what were some of the most important economic effects that the report highlighted? Um, well, you're going to have, like, land will produce too much Everything, like, because the climate's going to change, and you won't really do as much calamity as you have been able to do with it. Yeah. Also, like hurricanes. Yeah. Know, so extreme year. weather is yeah. a big thing. Reduction in farm yields is a, yeah. another. <laughs> There's one other thing that's really big. Do you, do you flooding. Remember? Flooding, yeah. So like like rising and that, that, those are all the main factors, yeah. Rises in sea level. Um, uh, and finally, there's also just the direct harms of like it being too warm. And pe some people like the Met, some people not like the Met. So for some people, that's positive, right? I think Chicago probably wouldn't be too depressed about a little bit of global warming. But, um, and finally, uh, they had to determine the extent to which adaptation to the climate change would mitigate some of these harms. Uh, and Sung Ho? Yeah. Uh, how might you go about thinking about that, or how did they think about that? Or? Well, they had, um, they just brought, um, like, as you said in the, in the slide, like, they lacked some kind of institutions. Like, for example, like, the Dust Bowl of the 30s. Yep. Um, they had, like, erosions and effects on the ecological systems, but they should have put more sort of economical approach to it, like, intuition-wise. Yeah. So what, what, what did it actually have on, not, not only on um, ecological systems, but on, like, second and third parties? That yeah, so, so like, for example, one thing you could do is look back in time at, like, other disasters that occurred and figure out, figure out how quickly people adapted to those situations. So, like, you know, the Dust Bowl uh, would not cause that much harm if people were able to, like, you know, change, um, take care of the soil better, move out of that area, whatever. And so you can look at how much harm was actually created by that, uh, not just how much it would seem like was created by it if people didn't figure out some way to accommodate to the disaster that occurred. Right? So you shouldn't just take things as given. You should look at how people actually adapted. One big problem, though, that the world is facing 
is that the incentives aren't really there for good adaptation. So, you know, Hurricane Katrina caused so much damage because no one had to pay, pay for flood insurance in Louisiana because they knew the government would come and bail them out afterwards rather than actually having to pay for the flood insurance. And that gives people very little incentive to move away from areas that are likely to get flooded as the waters rise through climate change, right? And so that, that's a big problem that I think might get in the way of some of this stuff. Yeah, Matt? Well, I think that does fall. Maybe that wouldn't that be a too specific or too time specific example? I mean, yeah. it was relatively sudden. While climate change, yeah. the effects would be felt more over you know decades and even a, a century. No question. So um, maybe that would you know people would have more time to adapt if it's you know for a longer period of time. No question. I mean, these things are really hard, right? I mean, there's not really good counterfactuals or good historical events examples of anything. You have to find something to compare things to, you know. So. Um, and you also had to do sort of a similar analysis for other uh, impacts of climate change um, beyond, sorry, other impacts of greenhouse gases beyond just changing the climate. And, and Clementina, do, do you remember what they uh, were talking about, about some of the other effects of greenhouse gases? Um, what, what are the to water? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The the ocean, the like flow of salt through the oceans, and also the the carbon itself makes it harder to for the air to absorb some of the salt out of the oceans. Uh, ecosystems can be damaged by the changes in the atmospheric gases or the temperatures. Lots of species might go extinct, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so. Um, Corresponding to the debate between, you know, cap and trade versus putting on a pollution tax, there were basically two approaches taken uh, in the report to figuring out uh, what the right type of intervention was. And, and Jeff, do you remember what those two approaches were? I think I might have read the wrong summary. All I remember seeing was just the recommended course of action. Oh. Well, so they basically thought about two, tell me if, if this was in it or not, but they, they, they talked about two ways. One way was to try to figure out what the marginal harm of a little bit more greenhouse gas was, you know, sort of given this situation that we're in or are likely to be in. Um, and the nice thing about taking this approach is it only required estimates of, like, the actual effects of climate change through the weather and so forth. You don't need to know anything about the technology that we have to adapt or what's likely to be invented that will help us, um, you know, reduce the amount of climate change and so forth, right? So this is simpler and less assumptions are needed to, to do this analysis, but the problem is that the effects of climate change are almost certainly very, very nonlinear. So like, you know, when you get past some point, like everything might really go to hell. And if that's the case, then it's really not sufficient just to say, here's what the marginal harm is right now. You have to figure out what's likely to be the amount that's polluted, and then you know, try to figure out, we don't really want to go much beyond some point. You know, how do we avoid doing that? Um, and you know, the reason why things can be so bad is that a few degrees warming might just you know, warm things up, make Chicago a bit more pleasant, um, and so forth. But uh, you know, seven or eight degrees warming could like potentially just extinct humanity or something like that. So, um, and <coughs> most of the harm associated with climate change actually doesn't come from the small effects. It comes from the potentially, the small probability of potentially catastrophic effects. So their estimate was that um, the marginal externality is approximately $85 per ton of uh, carbon emitted. The other approach they took was to think about the socially optimal level of carbon. And the good thing about that is that dealt with this nonlinearity. It let us actually like, figure out what would be the right amount uh, that we don't want to go beyond. But it requires really understanding what are the opportunities for mitigation. Because if there are you know, easy things we could invent that would allow us to greatly reduce carbon, this is going to suggest a very low level. If there aren't other things that are easy to invent, this might suggest a quite high level, 
And we were like highly uncertain about that, much more uncertain even than we are about the climate effects. So um, their estimate was that it would be optimal to stabilize the atmospheric carbon at 450 to 550 parts <coughs> per million, um, which would basically lead most likely to somewhere between a 3 to 5 uh, centigrade rise in temperatures, but could potentially lead to a lot more or a lot less. So um, the, I think the thing that's useful about reading the Stern report is less that it's you know, a template for how you should conduct these things, but rather it shows you how difficult it is to do one of these analyses because there's so many things that are uncertain. And this is even with the best minds in the world working on it. The IPCC, the Inter International Panel on Climate Change, on which the scientific parts of this were based, you know, comprised something like 50 Nobel Prize winning scientists and like uh, almost 2,000 other scientists. And yet all they have is these highly, highly uncertain numbers. Um, and it's not even clear what <coughs> those uncertainties depend on, which different people might disagree on. So it's, it's just, it's very, um, very ambiguous. But this is the sort of thing you need to do if you want to re really figure out what externalities are. So that's, that's just the, the job of uh, determining externalities. And there's a bunch of things that could radically change this analysis. Um, so for example, there's something called geoengineering, which involves um, alternatives to just reducing carbon that might uh, that might stop the worst outcomes of climate change. So you can put these sulfites into the atmosphere that reflect uh, the sun and basically cool things down artificially. And um, that might eliminate the worst possible outcomes, right? Because if it starts to really get hot and that's really a problem, you could always use this stuff. That might be unpleasant. That stuff might cause acid. I mean, there's all sorts of problems with that. But it could at least avoid some of the worst outcomes. But once you're avoiding the worst outcomes, if those were the source of most of the harms, then maybe climate change isn't so bad. So depending on how bad those things are or how much they allow you to avert the worst of the outcomes, that could really radically change a lot of the analysis. So it just depends on a lot of things. Uh, and so it's a very difficult exercise. Um, OK, so the Stern Review basically focused on very sort of hard economic costs, like the sea levels rise, they wipe out a city. Or, you know, the, um, the rains stop and you can't grow crops. So those are things that are relatively easy to measure, sort of from a obje relatively objective perspective. But there's a lot of other stuff that's really hard to measure. So for example, do people like it being warmer or cooler or rainier <coughs> or whatever, right? Um, and while that might sound a bit silly and maybe not a major source of harm, the truth is that like, real estate in the San Francisco Bay Area for the same thing is about four times as expensive as it is in Chicago. And I mean, along other dimensions, I guess some people might argue San Francisco is a nicer city than Chicago, but I don't think very much. So you know, it's got to be that the reason that land is so much more expensive in California is people really like the weather there, right? And that's like a huge amount of money. So if you were to turn Chicago into having the same weather as California, that might have you know, economic benefits on the order of like, you know, a percent or two of GDP, right? Um, similarly, but how do we measure that, right? I mean, you can use these real estate things, but it's, it's tough. How much do people care about the animals that might die? How, how are we supposed to value that, right? Um, you know, global warming has the potential to cause giant mass extinctions, and we have to figure out some way to value all that stuff. Um, we also have to think, you know, what value does it have to the world if New York City gets wiped out? I mean, obviously part of that is just the economic, purely economic losses, but I think everyone would say that, you know, Washington, D.C. or New York City getting wiped out has some real value beyond the economic losses, which is that it has sort of a moral or, you know, spiritual meaning for most Americans, right? Um, we put a lot of value on preserving cultural artifacts, so how do you value those? Another thing is that... Um, when we think about uh, the costs of um, reducing uh, pollution, or the costs for an agriculture for an agriculture of adapting to the warmer climates, the farmers themselves and the innovators, the people who are technologists themselves, know a lot more about those things 
then do um, like sort of a panel of scientific experts. So all of these share the fact that just scientific uh, expertise and data collection is really not going to get you all the information that you need to address these problems. And this is really true for a quite broad class of cases. Anytime when there's some subjective existence value for having something like a culture or preserving a language, preserving uh, species, etc. Um, and while some expert, uh, you, this could just be assigned by an expert, this should, could just be an expert who's in charge of figuring out how much that is. But other people might think, well, it depends on how much individual people in our society value that thing existing. Um, another time when this happened is, you know, imagine that you have a house and you're, uh, it's been in your you know, family for generations. Only you really know how much you value that house, right? But it's not based on its objective economic value. It's based on a subjective value that the house has for you, right? Um, and so anytime there's sort of something that you value in a very idiosyncratic, personal way, it's going to be really hard to determine that purely based on an objective economic analysis. And finally, um, you know, local information about technology or about the impacts of various things uh, can be very important, as we talked about with agriculture and with the innovations. Yeah? I agree with one and three, but two, like, you could easily get a value of a property, right? Like, if I have a price that is, like, at market value, and you decline it, then clearly you have a high, and then, like, there would be a price, right? That, like, well, no, I, I agree with what you're saying, Ben, but you can only... I, I, so I totally agree that there are ways to get these out of people, and that's what we're going to talk about with the rest of the class. But the point is you couldn't do that without interacting with the relevant person, right? In other words, you have to try to get... I mean, I could just come up to you and say, how much do you value it? That might work. I mean, it might not, but it might work, right? And, but the point is I can't get that by just doing a scientific analysis or, like, you know, collecting data. I have to actually talk to the person. You know what I mean? You don't think you could do, like, you could ask like X number of people about their house property that, that they have, that which they have like a certain other value to that's not because it's in their family and then we'd probably come up with like... Well you could have a distribution but you probably couldn't figure out for an individual. So imagine that there was like a hurricane and it was only going to wipe out one guy's house. You might know from other people what the distribution of people's willingness to pay to keep their houses but you wouldn't know what that individual person was and so you, it would be hard to figure out what the exact externality was of that hurricane. Um, okay, so when such information is very important um, and there's no way around trying to gather it, then what we have to do is try to find some way to get it out of people, as Ben was just talking about. We have to, you know, maybe try to get them to buy or sell the thing that we're talking about, or we need to ask them, or something like that, right? Um, and we don't want this information just to be their opinion or somebody else's opinion or a guess. We want it to. Um, uh, we want them to give us whatever personal information they have about uh, the thing they value, and by that we mean not that. Um, just whatever they value the thing at is by definition what it's worth. But rather that we think there might be something that they actually genuinely know, like this has been in their family for generations or something, which is relevant to how we as a society value them losing that. Right? So one example of this might be the inherent value of cultures. So um, This is a difficult issue, so a lot of people think it's a bad thing if there's an ancient civilization that, like, the um, language is now dying out because of modern culture, and that we want to try to preserve that and maybe give subsidies to keep uh, people speaking that language. And there's basically two approaches we can take to thinking about that. One is we could say, look, we as a society just put the following amount of value on it, and we're going to come up with that on the basis of some philosophical argument. Another approach is to say, well, look, we value it as a society to the extent that each individual person in our society values it, and we don't know how much each person values it, so we might have to take some sort of a survey to figure that out. Um, and uh, if we do need to take that sort of a survey, 
that's sort of the, the most natural first approach is literally to go around and take a survey. And in fact, that's a very traditional and simple approach that has a very long history. It's called contingent valuation, which is a little bit of a fancy word for just the survey. Um, and all that it means is what you do is you go to people, you describe different situations, you ask how much individuals would be willing to pay to have situation A rather than situation B, and then you assume that this is how much they're truly willing to pay for that, um, and you use that to determine uh, you know, how much externalities are created by changes in different situations. The most common uh, thing for which this is used is environmental issues, uh, such as uh, the value of creating, uh, sorry, we'll, we'll talk about some examples in a moment. It's also used to determine how much people would be willing to pay um, for a new transportation route or for a new bridge or a new building or some other public work. Um, so, uh, Mike, um, what are some examples of, you know, things for which continued valuation has been used? Like the type of questions that I asked? Yeah, like what, like what, what, what do contingent valuation surveys like try to gauge people's values for? Uh, like a good example might be like animals, so like how much would you value if there was an oil spill? <coughs> yeah, that, that's a great example. You know, yeah. uh, preserving visibility at the Grand Canyon is one famous example. Um, preserving seals or whales in the ocean. Avoiding logging of national forests. Uh, value of birds killed by the Exxon Valdez. These are all actually real examples that people have done and that have influenced public policy. Value of preserving a language or an, uh, of an indigenous culture, value of a new building in a city. And these tend to be commissioned in practice, and they're commissioned, I would say there's probably a thousand of these or something like that. I mean, this is a, this is a huge industry that does stuff like this. Commissioned by regulatory agencies, courts, governments, etc. cetera. Um, and the benefits, uh, these form part of a benefit-cost analysis of externalities, regulations, and other actions by governments. They're also often used to assess the damage caused by an oil spill. So when there's something like the Deepwater Horizon, some, I bet there were quite a few contingent valuation surveys run to determine how much liability they had for the you know, number of, uh, of birds that they killed. And almost all of these are formal and money-based. That is, they say, Situation A, situation B, how much would you pay to get situation A versus situation B? But sometimes they're also a bit more informal than this. So sometimes they're just surveys of public opinion, like, you know, how bad do you think this would be? Or do you support or not support the following? Um, and these aren't exactly the same <coughs> as the valuation because they're usually sort of binary. But they have some similarities and, some, and they have similar types of impacts on public policy sometimes. Because politicians look a lot at public opinion polls about questions, right? And so, in some ways, you can think of the whole public opinion polling industry as sort of a very simplified example of doing contingent valuation study. Okay. <coughs> now, economists are pretty darn skeptical of contingent valuation studies for the most part. And Steve, what, why do you think that's the case? Because uh, <coughs> it's hard for... Uh, individuals to like put a price on, on that because they don't really know what the situation is like it, if yeah. you're there as opposed to thinking about it. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a very important reason. So people, one thing is that people just don't even take these things seriously. Like, I don't know if you've ever gotten one of these surveys, but it's sort of like, okay, leave me alone, you know? Like, you give some answer, but you don't think about it at all, right? Um, I mean, would you guys, if someone came in and asked you this, like really sit there and like, try to figure it out much, or would you just like try to get rid of the guy? You know? Uh, the other thing is, often they give the answer to the wrong question in some sense. So they say how much they're willing to, how much they think sort of society overall should be willing to pay for this, rather than how much personally would it hurt them if this happened. But that, how much it would personally hurt them is what matters. You know, a lot of times people either say uh, how much society should be willing to pay, or they think of it like a charity. You know, it's like, oh, I, I'm going to give some money to stop this bad thing from happening, but not because it actually harms me, just because I think it would be bad for the world, right? 
So it's very hard to get people to actually answer the question that you want them to answer. Um, another uh, thing is that, as Steve pointed out, people often have no clue about this stuff. Like, you know, for example, if you say, how much would you be willing to pay to keep some African language group that you've never heard of from, you know, going from stopping speaking it, you might answer something, but like, you have no idea, is this like some incredibly important historical language that like you, we should value a lot? Or is this like something that a guy made up one day and you started speaking with his friends and now they've all decided that this is stupid uh, and they want to stop speaking it, right? So I mean, it's just like really hard, I mean, you just don't have the facts. And you know, a lot of these environmental things are really extreme like that. It's like, you know, there's some forest you've never heard of. How much are you willing to pay to keep that forest there? It's like, well, maybe it's an incredibly important forest that's like host to some amazing ecosystem, or maybe it's like some guy's backyard. You know, <laughs> you really have no idea. So um, it really takes a lot of reflection and thought to figure out a thoughtful answer to this, and most people aren't going to put that in. Um, another thing is that a lot of people's answers are motivated not by like what they actually would be willing to pay, or even what they think would be good for society, but like what they think either the survey uh, giver wants to hear, or what they think other people would think well of them for. So, you know, given that there's no consequences for the decision that they're making, they might as well say they'd be willing to pay a million dollars to preserve, you know, the seagulls, because, every, because then they can like pat themselves on the back and say, oh, I'm such a good person, I'd pay all this money for the seagulls, even if they never actually would, because they, you know, aren't forced to. So, um, the other thing which is sort of indicative of all this stuff and that just the methodology is very flawed is that if you ask the question one way, you get one answer. If you ask the question another, apparently identical, but you know, just slightly reworded way, you can get something that's like two or three orders of magnitude different. So it's sort of like, you know, it's not very clear that this is going to be a useful way for, for people to think about it. And also, these are situations that people are never, never think about, right? You know, if you ask me how much am I willing to pay to get like a slightly better orange juice, that's a decision I have to make every day, right? So I might have a good sense for that. If you ask me how much I'm willing to pick one of these things, it's like, I have no idea. I've never thought about that. I've never had to worry about that. So like, why should you think that the person will have any sense of what the right answer is? And then, you know, yeah. So. Uh, with all those problems, this is, a lot of economists think this is a bunch of nonsense. However, that's not the worst of it. So actually, uh, the worst problem comes when there are actually incentives um, involved in this. So, uh, it, and the incentives depend on what the survey is actually used for. So one thing the survey could be used for is like for us to talk about in class and for like economists to think about, in which case it has no effect on the world, basically, right? So what are people's incentives in this case, uh, Ben? Um, they're, they're just like, like who the people taking Yeah, yeah. There are none? Like there are no facts? Yes, so they sort of like... Yeah, whatever. It's sort of like what we just talked about. It's like sort of whatever, uh, the other people, right? Yeah, so in that case, people don't really care, right? Um, which is itself is pretty problematic, right? Because for all the reasons we just talked about. Uh, and in fact, it's not even clear why people are even willing to take the survey other than their own personal entertainment. Uh, and in fact, a lot of these continued evaluation surveys are used for nothing more than sort of like economists to talk about. And so, I don't think people take them very seriously. Um, but, uh, Bill, what if these surveys actually did affect public policy? Then what would people's incentives be like? Well, depending on the issue, they have an incentive to report either way. So if like, yeah. you wanted to save animals, then you want to like, conduct a survey in a way that has people imply that they want to save the animals and the other way around too. Yeah, exactly. So like, what people do is that, imagine you want to save the animals. But you're never going to have to actually pay the amount of money that it takes to save them. Well, you could say, I'm willing to pay $200 billion to save the animals, right? Because you know that'll get the survey guy to say, oh, shit, we should really save the animals, right? 
And given that you never have to pay the money, you know, it's no skin off your nose, right? So, uh, on the other hand, if you think that the animals are totally stupid, you just say, look, I'm not willing to pay anything to save them, even if you were willing to pay a little bit, because you want to convince them not to save the animals. So, to the extent that this actually is used for anything, which it maybe isn't that much, but to the extent that it is, people are going to have like, completely the wrong incentives. They're going to never be honest. They're just going to go to the most extreme thing they can say for whatever uh, the thing, the um, position that they have is. So people are never going to have an incentive to reveal tr truthfully their willingness to pay in this case. Yeah, sure. So that's a good impact of paying people to be extraneous Well, the problem is the payment just gets you to take the survey, but it doesn't change what you report within the survey, right? Am I? Am I? Yeah. What if you yeah. um, gave the survey um, both ways? For example, you yeah. gave it one saying that, oh, we're going to knock down this building, and give it another time saying, oh, we're going to preserve this building. You take an average of both. Does that help? Well, there, there's a lot more ways than you can manipulate yeah. it than that. So people have figured out, like, all sorts of subtle manipulations. They're like, there's a hundred buildings in the city. We're going to knock down this one. <laughs> there's a thousand buildings in the country. We're going to knock down this one. You'll get literally like an order of magnitude bigger thing. If you, or you could say if there's 10 uh, buildings in the neighborhood, we're going to knock down this one. When you put the neighborhood, they'll say they're willing to pay a lot. When you say the city, they'll say live less. And when you say the country, they'll say even less. And so you can get it, people to give any number you want them to give, basically. Except when it has a real impact on policy, in which case they report incredibly extreme stuff. And the point is, if this thing doesn't have a real impact on policy, why are we wasting our money giving the survey anyway, right? So the whole thing sort of makes no sense. Uh, so uh, one of my favorite examples of this came from The um, Economist. So the Economist reporter went down to Haiti. And he surveyed a bunch of people about whether they were getting aid from like the US and so forth. And everyone said, nope, we're not getting anything. Uh, you know, we, we haven't received any supplies. He then followed them, and he saw that their houses were like filled with supplies that like said the UN on them. And then he said, why did you lie to me? And they said, well, you know, if people find out that we're getting supplies, they're not going to send anymore. Right? <laughs> so, so as long as people have incentives, they're not going to report truthfully. Yeah, Ben? I wonder if this might be a little bit of a tangent, but like the, yeah. the political polling, if yeah. the same truths, or, like if those same things are true about like, surveys, and like whether, I guess, the economist doesn't trust polls or things that they're like, well, the thing that's a little bit, so there, there's something that's a little bit better about a poll, which is that a poll is binary. So you can't like exaggerate how much you care about something in a poll. You know what I mean? You can just say like, am I in favor or am I against well, the well, thing? Like, like who, like, like the Republican Party, right? like they're like, there are more than two candidates, right? So like, yeah, but, but again, it's, it's not like people are going to exaggerate something in that. Like they're going to, people are going to have an incentive to say, that, I mean, if, assuming that the person who gets the most votes in the poll, like does the best in the election, people are always going to be truthful on those things. You know what I mean? But when you ask people how much they're willing to pay, then you open it up to like a lot more problems than the polling does. But even the polling can be incredibly bad when it comes to stuff that people aren't like really used to voting on. So like polls for referendums are notoriously terrible. I would say that they have like a 52% like uh, chance of predicting the correct thing. So like in California, they had this whole like legalized marijuana initiative. And the polls like consistently were showing like 65% of people supporting it. And then the election came around and 20% voted in favor of it. So it was like, I guess people sort of felt good about themselves to think they were a liberal person, you know, supporting, but in the end they didn't really want it. Or what, who knows what their motivation was, but it, it, it didn't work very well, so. And, and people like never have to vote on this sort of stuff. So. You know, at least the polls, they have some experience voting on this stuff. These things are just like, come completely out of the blue from some, you know, hippie guy who's coming around with a, you know, white, you know, a, a clipboard and a piece of paper, right? So, um, okay. So, the point that I was trying to make is that if we w actually want to take seriously the problem of figuring out how we can get this information out of people, we need to think more seriously about what they have an incentive to say and what they have an incentive not to say, right? And let's, let's put a little bit of a mo model on this. 
So imagine that the private benefits of an activity are B of Q, and we want to determine the socially optimal amount. Now, if there were no externalities, that would be just to set B prime equal to zero, but there might be some externalities associated with this. Now, imagine each individual knows the harm that is created for him or her, and the total harm created is just the sum of the harms to all the individuals, and so the optimal level of Q is going to maximize the difference between uh, the benefits and the harms, right? And so the question is, how can we get us people to tell us the truth about the harms? Now, one way to think about this is just to push the problem back one layer, which is to say, if I report a particular value of my harm, um, that's really an action that I'm taking. Because that is going to influence how much of the activity is going to occur. And so <coughs> you can make me pay the externalities that are caused by my saying I'm harmed by something you're doing. Right? If I pay all the externalities, then I'll have an incentive to tell the truth. Just as if I pay the externalities, I have an incentive to do the action that's in society's best interest. So the question is, what are the externalities created by my reporting some particular value h hat rather than a, uh, that I have no harm? Um, well, imagine I reported I wasn't harmed at all. What would happen? We would maximize the difference between the benefits and the costs to everyone other than me, right? That would be the social optimum if I said that I wasn't harmed by the activity. Right? Um, and we could call the optimum, in this case, Q star sub negative i. Because negative i means it doesn't include me. I'm guy i. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if I report h hat, then what they're going to do is maximize the difference between the benefits, the cost to everyone else, and the cost to me, which I said was h hat, right? And let's call the optimal under that q star hat. The externality that I then cause is the difference between um, what everybody else, other than me, including the benefits and the cost to other people, would get in the case when we had q star sub negative i, and in the case when we had q star hat. Right? So the externality that I cause, let me give a graphical example of this. So imagine this is the benefit. That's the harm to everyone else. If I report a harm to me that's like that, then we would add these up horizontally to figure out the optimum. Maybe it would be something like that. This would be what the outcome was without me. Sorry, this is the outcome without me. This is the outcome with me. And the harm to everybody else from moving here from here is that Harburger triangle. Right? Because that's the difference between everybody else's uh, harm and everybody else's benefit that's caused by me reporting what I report. Right, so that's what I'm forced to pay. Um, okay, so the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism asks that people, whenever they make a report of how much they're harmed by something, have to pay that Harburger triangle, that dead weight loss triangle. So here's the Vickery Clark Gro Groves mechanism. Everyone reports the harm to them. Um, a cap on the amount of the activity is set at Q star, maximizing the difference between the benefits and the harms. And then every individual pays the difference, the amount of harm caused to everyone other than themselves as a result of them reporting what they did, rather than reporting zero. That's the Vickery-Clark-Groves mechanism. 
And then, if you want, you can have people receive or make some payment, which doesn't depend on what they say. But, but that's sort of unrelated. So there are two really important things to note about this. First, is that an individual doesn't need to report the full harm that they cause. They could just report any piece of information they have. So, for example, I could say, look, I don't know how much the hurricane is going to hurt my house. But I do know that if I lost my house, here's what, how much it's worth to me. Right? Now, that'll go into some <coughs> calculation of a climate model and so forth and influence something. And um, that, uh, they'll have the true, right incentives to report truthfully on that, even if they don't know all the information. So one nice thing about that is that people <coughs> only need to tell you what, they, what it is that they know. They don't need to tell you, they don't need to know the whole thing. Um, and the second thing is that externalities, when I make my payments into this mechanism, that dead weight loss triangle, that money cannot go to the people who got hurt by what I did. It has to go to the government or to someone who's completely uninvolved with this situation. <coughs> The reason is, if it went to the other people who are hurt by this, then everyone would have an incentive to say, oh, I'm going to be really hurt if he reports this, because then I'm going to expect that he's going to report that and I'll get a bunch of money. So it destroys the incentive properties if other people get the money that you pay for the harm that you do to them. Um, and we're going to see that that's going to cause some really big problems. So, the most common practical application of the Victory Clark Groves mechanism is what's called the second price auction. And, and Federico, could you describe what, what the second price auction is? Was that, was that the it, it was in the variant. Oh, right, yeah. right. Um, so, you have the auction, um, and the person who wins only has to pay what the previous bid was? So yeah, the that's exactly right. That's the second price auction. So he doesn't pay what he bid, he pays what the, set, the person who just lost the auction bid. Um, and notice that this is in some sense his externality, right? Because if he hadn't bid, then the other guy would have gotten it, and the other guy uh, valued it at that much, so your externality from having bid is the price that the other guy would have paid. So that's uh, that's... The reason that the second price auction is an example of the Vickery Clark growth mechanism. Yeah, Clementina. But couldn't you like make a very high bid and then the other person would bid again, but you just would have to bid what the other person did? So if like somebody bid ten, yeah. you could bid then like a hundred, but then the other person wouldn't bid again because it didn't have a hundred and you would only have to pay ten. Exactly. That's exactly how it works. Yeah, but like wouldn't that just create an incentive to bid very high but then not have to pay a lot? No. So let's go through the logic of it. Okay. So Condition. So, first thing I want to just state, and now I'll try to show you why it's the case, is that um, everyone has an incentive to report their true value for the thing. Unlike what Clementina was saying, but it's a good question. And the reason is, conditional on your winning or losing, how much you pay has nothing to do with what you bid. So, you only want to make sure that you win and lose in the right cases. Not that you bid the right amount given that you're winning or losing. So that's the first thing to notice. And the second thing is you never want to win at a price above what you're willing to pay, and you never want to lose at a price below what you're willing to pay. Why is that? Um, well, imagine you bid lower than what you're willing to pay. And, but there's someone who beats you, who's between what you're willing to pay and that number. Well, then you could have beat that person and you would have been better <coughs> off, right? On the other hand, imagine that you bid higher and you end up winning at a price above what you're willing to pay. Well, if there was someone between what you were willing to pay and that price who bid there, then you're in trouble because you have to pay more than it's worth to you. So you always have an incentive to report exactly what it's worth to you. Yeah, Ben? Isn't the, this is conditional also on like information. Like, if you can figure out what the other people want to pay for it, then, then you can see the system. No, that's not true. I know that you're, like, the maximum that you've ever been willing to pay is 50. Yep. And then all but, I have to do... But I, I still can't do any better than just reporting my true value. 
is that what I pay has nothing to do with what um, I bid as long as I win. So if I know the maximum you're willing to pay is 50, I might as well bid my true value, maybe that's 200, because I still only have to pay 50. That's what's so brilliant about this system. Um, it's actually quite related to the English auction. The English auction is when people just you know, raise their hand and the price goes up. Because in reality, what you basically do is you have in the back of your mind, here's the maximum I'm going to bid. And you know, if it gets up to a certain level, I drop out. And I end up just paying whatever the la last person who dropped out was. So in some sense, this is just a way, in a sealed bid context, of running the English auction. Now, um, this is sometimes used in what are called multi-unit or package auctions. And in those contexts, you can't just use this like uh, simple second price things, because what you're bidding for are not like one good, but there's like a hundred different things. So like what they did in the FCC is there were all these different parts of the country, and they carved up the country into different parts, and then carved up each part of the country into different parts of the spectrum. And then people could submit a bid for any collection of all this stuff, right? And the point is there's a zillion different things they could bid for. There's a zillion different ways it could be assigned across people. And so to figure out what people you know, should pay in the, the second price basically required uh, doing the whole VCG thing. It's like, if this person hadn't bid anything, then what would have the allocation have been? And how much does it hurt people that he, you know, that's the sort of analysis you need to do. You, this is actually also exactly what they do at the Booth School for doing course selection. So what happens at the Booth School is you submit your list of courses and like what you're willing to pay for each list of courses, and then you have this like artificial currency where whatever you um, bid, uh, you know they figure out what your VCG payment is basically, and that's what you have to pay. Um, and there are many proposals to use this in other contexts, but it's very uncommon in practice. One example, and, and this actually comes out of a paper that I uh, worked on, is an alternative to using eminent domain. So instead of using eminent domain, uh, you know, where the government just comes in and if it wants to build you know, a road through an area, it just takes people's land and pays them something. If you want to figure out whether it's actually efficient to take that away from them, based on how much people value their homes, you could use a VCG mechanism where everyone says, here's how much I'm willing to pay to stay. The government says, here's how much I'm willing to pay to take the land. And you have used some me mechanism like this. Um, OK, so why isn't uh, VCG used uh, more often? Well, there's a famous article uh, which is often used to summarize uh, VCG, which is to say that it's elegant. It kind of it has this amazing incentive property, but we don't actually see it being used. So it's called uh, lovely but lonely. Uh, and uh, is Temis here? But does anyone else have an idea why VCG isn't used very much in practice? Yeah, go ahead, Kurt. Like you said before, there has to be, <coughs> there has to be a third party administrator. Yeah, so there has to be someone else who can take the money out. And that causes a whole bunch of problems. So that, that's a problem in itself, but it's a source of a lot of other problems. So what do you do with the leftover money? It has to go to the government rather than to the individuals involved. And this might be fine if there's only a few people who are affected by this, because you can use the money on someone else in society. But if the externality affects large numbers of people, or maybe the whole society, what are you supposed to do with that money? You'd have to like burn it, or like ship it to a foreign country, or something like that, right? Um, and this can effectively ruin the efficiency. Because even if you get like the right allocation, all that money that you lose is real money. And, and, and it's a shame to lose it, right? Uh, a second problem is collusion. So uh, this is one of the worst problems because two people can basically blow up the whole system. Um, so. Imagine that we used VCG to determine the outcome of an election. There were just two, candidate A could win or candidate B could win. And everyone was said to say how much they'd be willing to pay for candidate A to win versus B winning. So some people's numbers would be positive, other people's numbers would be negative. Now, in principle, that could be very efficient. But the problem is that imagine that there were just two people who wanted you know, Bush rather than Gore to win, right? And they each said they were willing to 
um, pay a trillion dollars to see Bush win over Gore win, right? Then they would win, right? For sure, because uh, they would outweigh everybody else, and they wouldn't have to pay anything. Why wouldn't they have to pay anything? Well, um, imagine that the one of the people who bid a tr said that they were willing to pay a trillion dollars wasn't participating. So individually, if two people both say really extreme things, individually neither of them makes a difference, and therefore they don't end up having to pay anything, right? And so what that means is, in general, in VCG, uh, two people can just totally blow up the system. They can get whatever they want and pay nothing for it. Yeah, Bill. In your example, I don't, I don't understand. Would, does everyone actually pay the amount? No. They, they, they pay, if they change, so what does VCG say? It says if you change the outcome, right? If what you're having said makes something different happen than would have happened otherwise, then you have to pay uh, the amount by which you hurt other people. So if there was one person and they said that they valued Bush winning at $1,000 and that was enough just to tip the scales, then they'd have to pay however much the total of everybody else was, you know, because that's how much harm they caused everybody else. But if two people each say a trillion dollars, right, then uh, removing either one of them makes no difference. And so uh, they can just completely sabotage the whole system. Sang Ho? Um, yeah, well, I had a question about the auction system. Yeah. Um, so then, wouldn't yelling out like enormous amount of money would always like sort of win you the win you the thing that you want to buy? Like but say, maybe for way too much money. Yeah, but then the thing is like, if everyone wants this like radio for like fifty bucks for like when you like fifty, sixty bucks, but then someone yells like sixty bucks and I yell like million dollars. Yeah. But then the next person who ever like. Um, yells out a bigger amount of money, he has a risk of actually like winning, right? But then yeah. he wouldn't really want to pay for uh, the radio like million, million dollars. That, that's right, but the way that the English auction works is it goes in very small increments, right. so that nobody can do a jump bid like what you're describing, and therefore discourage right. other people from participating. But there are problems of collusion, which is that, imagine that everybody knows that Anthony's willing to pay more than Sun Ho is to buy something. Then you, you somehow have no incentive really to bid anything. I mean, you could you could bid what you want, but you know you're never going to win anyway. So you might as well bid zero. It, as, it, I mean, it, maybe Anthony comes up to you and says, somehow let me just give you a dollar and just don't bid anything. Then I'll get it for free. You know I'm going to win anyways. So, so that's another example of this type of collusion that's very easy to do in this case. And it can get even worse. So it's not just that different people can collude with one another. It's that, imagine that there was like one person, and they could just pretend like they were two people, somehow. Right? Then, they can get whatever they want, for zero. <coughs> right? So, that's a pretty messed up system. If, you know, one person, just by being two, can get whatever they want and pay nothing. Right? Um, so, in practice, VCG is a total disaster. Even though it's this beautiful idea, it doesn't actually make sense in any real world context, basically. So, why does VCG um, go so badly wrong? Um, well, the basic problem is exactly what was identified uh, by Cody, which is that um, in this context, everyone has to um, say what other people's externalities are on them, right? That is, we're taking each person's word for what the externalities caused by someone else are. Um, and what that means is that uh, everyone is going to have an incentive to get in league with whoever it is that's determining what the externality they cause is and collude with them, right? Um, and uh, basically, the, the problem we have is that while this system can be very useful for getting each individual to report what, what their value is, they're affecting other people. So if in any way they can talk to one another, they, or if my payments, rather than just going to some outside person, go to the other person, then that's going to totally mess up all the incentive properties.
because the externalities people are paying is determined completely by what someone else says rather than by some objective information. So the, the very value of the system, which is that it bases the externalities on what people say, is exactly its problem. Right? So what we need instead is some sort of an objective information at some point down the line, which says, okay, we're willing to take people's <coughs> word on what the externality is in this sense, but we need to know something more objective about what the externality caused by them saying that is, so we're not just relying on other people for that. Because otherwise they're going to have an incentive to get into league with those other people and it will mess up the system. Um, that is, we need to make people prove that in fact other people are exerting an externality on them, not just claim that they are. Because otherwise it's going to be too easy for those people to get together and, and collude with each other. And these problems are actually very closely uh, related to one another. So if one person is going to pay for saying that another person uh, did something wrong, then we need to know uh, uh, we need to know what the other the other person might do. Um, and so that is going to require us to bring in some more objective information. So in particular, it would be very useful if rather than just relying on people to tell us what all the externalities were, <coughs> if we had some external objective information about what we expect the externalities of people to be. And in fact, there's a famous theorem which shows that any efficient system requires that every time someone changes the decision we make as a society, they have to pay the average externality that they cause. That's basically just an application of Pigou's principle that we learned last class. And VCG satisfies this because everybody pays the exact externality that they in fact end up causing. But that's not necessary. All that's necessary is that everyone pays the average externality they're likely to cause. Averaged over what the values of everyone else is. Um, and if this, if we don't have to just rely on what everybody else says to determine this, but we have some objective basis, we can do a lot better <coughs> than we can uh, for these collusion reasons if we have to always rely on exactly what everyone says. Um, so for example, if we have people just pay their expected externalities rather than the ones they actually end up causing, then we can pay the money back to everyone. Because no one's individual report affects what other people pay. And, there, and therefore what they receive back and therefore they don't have an incentive to lie about it. There's no more issue with collusion, because us getting together can't affect what I have to pay. So the more um, we use uh, this sort of expected externality, the less collusion we can do and the more money we can give back. Um, and sometimes it can be pretty easy to compute the expected externality. So for example, the more common than a second price auction is a first price sealed bid auction, where you just say how much you're willing to pay. And basically, you can show that in that case, people are going to bid how much, and it makes perfect sense, they expect the next person to bid, how much they just have to do to beat the next guy. right? And so that gets them to pay their expectation of the externality, rather than having them pay what the externality ends up being. And that makes it much harder to do the sort of collusive things that I was talking about, uh, Anthony and Sinho did. Um, and there's other circumstances where examples like this exist. So just to wrap up, um, and in fact, I'm right now working on an alternative way to do elections uh, based on expected externalities rather than on the VCG thing. Because the VCG thing's all mess messed up. But if you can make people pay expected externalities, that can be much more efficient than, than elections are, actually. So to summarize, uh, there's basically no perfect solution <coughs> to figure out the information we need to determine what externalities are. Scientific and technical studies play a really important role, because usually the scientists involved have pretty good incentives, and we're able to incorporate a lot of expert information. But the problem with it is that it leaves out a lot of this subjective and private information that we were talking about. Contingent valuation surveys try to incorporate this private information, but do it in a pretty terrible way and, and aren't very reliable. The VCG mechanism is simple and powerful and robustly gives people individual incentives to reveal the right type of information, but in practice it's a bit of a disaster. <coughs>
Um, the expected externality mechanism is much more practically useful when you can do it, but there's a basic problem of figuring out how do we get people to, how do we figure out what the expected externalities are? That just asks another informational problem. So the truth is that in practice, we, we're going to have to combine all of these approaches to try to make something work. Um, and in fact, we should also be open to less clean alternatives, which are less clearly efficient, things like voting. Because as we were talking about earlier, Ben, in voting, people can't say these extreme things like, I value it a huge amount or a little amount. They just say, well, I like this or I don't. And even though that's not going to give us efficiency, it's not going to see the total amount in favor and against. It's just going to see how many people are in favor or against. It might still be better than the alternatives that are available to us. Um, great. And good luck with the problem set. See you on Tuesday. <laughs>